Good afternoon. We'll get started this session. Can you hear me yet? Are we on? OK. Welcome. I uh, realize some of you here probably uh, just got so mesmerized by the previous class, you haven't left yet. <laughs> and others of you are maybe, if you're honest, here because you want a seat for the next class. <laughs> so here we are, in between. Glad you're here. Um, and we're going to get started. Yeah, I, I want to just kind of pray over us as we get ready to jump into our time. And I'm uh, so glad uh, that you're here. And uh, it's fun to get to spend a little bit of time together. So I'll pray over us. And, uh, and we'll jump in uh, to our time together. Uh, Father, thank you for these men and women. Uh, I thank you for who you are, God, and what you're doing. Uh, I thank you that we get to be gathered in just such an amazing place um, like this. Uh, for several days to just disconnect from uh, all that's normal, uh, the distractions and the joys of home even, to, to just disconnect. Father, uh, I love you. I thank you for who you are. Jesus, we love you. Holy Spirit, we love you. Thank you for being here. Uh, would you open our hearts and our minds? Would uh, you fill us with your presence today? Would you encourage us and strengthen us? Would you make us more like your son, Jesus? Um, uh, God, would you uh, open our ears and our eyes to whatever it is that you'd have us hear and to see and to think about uh, today? Uh, it's in your name I pray. Uh, amen. amen. And so, so glad that you're here. Uh, my name's Dave. And I want to take just a minute uh, to kind of introduce uh, my buddy Leonard here and uh, kind of the class that we're going to be doing. Uh, today is the first part of a three-day uh, class that we're going to be doing. And uh, Mike Cope had called us in the fall and said, uh, or called me in the fall and he said, Dave, I want you to, to spend a few days uh, with Leonard. And uh, honestly, is one of the invitations that I'm so excited about because uh, up until two years ago, um, Leonard was not a guy that uh, I knew. I knew of him. Uh, many of you maybe know of Leonard. Uh, maybe you've read his books, maybe you've heard his teachings, but he's one of those guys that I had uh, admired from a distance. And about two years ago, he and his wife Holly uh, moved to Nashville, Tennessee, where I live, and served as a church planter in downtown Nashville. And, and Leonard showed up, and I remember the first Sunday I saw him sitting out in the audience. And I, I don't know if you've ever tried preaching to someone that is exponentially smarter than you, um, <laughs> but, but it is horrible. And I looked out, I thought, oh no, there's Leonard Allen. And, and I just thought, I'll, I'll just pray and sit down and we'll take communion. And, and uh, he, he came up afterwards and said, hey, I, I want to take you to breakfast. And I thought, oh no, and uh, you know, this is it. And so um, we went to breakfast, and I don't know if you've ever been around Leonard, um, but uh, one of the things that I love about him is he's one of those guys, the closer you get, the better he is. And you can't say that about a lot of people. I remember sitting down at breakfast with him, and, he, you know, he's probably embarrassed that I'm saying all this, but I remember sitting down at breakfast with him, and I thought, this guy has more vision in his pinky than, than most of us have uh, in our entire lives. I just remember seeing the, the glory of God upon his life and his heart and the passion for Jesus and the passion for the kingdom and I remember just thinking, thank God that you've come to our city. And thank you, Lord, that you've put him in our church family. And uh, he's, he's written an amazing book. Some of you have actually read it. Uh, I'm just going to kind of give a plug here so he doesn't have to. Um, but if you've never read this book, Cruciform Church, it actually came out a while ago. There's a new edition to it um, with some new content. It would be really helpful in light of the conversation that we're having this week. But uh, I'm honored uh, to just get to hang with you for the next few days. And I'm excited that you all um, will be here. Leonard will be here to, de to deliver the content. And I'll, I will be here just to say amen uh, to that and to what he's doing. So uh, there you go. Well, th this, is, um, this is an exciting uh, opportunity for us to partner here. And let me say a few words about Dave. Uh, Dave is a millennial. I'm um, one of the, what do they call the boom, a boomer, an aging boomer, and here here we are together, teaching this, and that's kind of the way it should be, I think, more often, because uh, Dave thinks differently about a lot of things than I do, and many of us do, and thank God for that. And some of the battles and struggles that I've had to deal with in my journey uh, in Christ. Uh, He's not had to deal with in the same way. And um, he, he's, he sees some things differently and freshly. And boy, what a blessing to, to be around the, the aura of that. My wife and I are members at the Ethos Church in Nashville. And um, Dave was the one to whom God gave the vision for that church um, 
eight or nine years ago, and uh, the church now is about seven and a half years old. And uh, it began in his home, and from there it moved to a, a park near downtown for a few months. And from there, moved into a place near downtown Nashville called the Cannery, which is an old cannery that was turned into a big nightclub and now is a thriving venue on Sundays for Ethos Church. They now have three campuses around downtown Nashville, um, and um, it's been an amazing and blessed experience for me to witness and participate in what's happening there. And um, we, we hope that in these three days you'll get some windows and glimpses into the experience of one church planter in an urban uh, city in the Bible Belt uh, to reach out. But to me, being there on a Sunday, at one of the three services at the cannery, uh, among hundreds and hundreds of young people, college students, young professionals, young families, a few older folks like me and others. Um, I can't tell you how, how exciting and, and encouraging it has been for me to see so many young people being turned on to Jesus, to the opportunities to serve in a city at the ground level, and um, this was the vision that God laid on uh, Dave's mind and heart about eight or so years ago. And uh, so what we're doing here these three days kind of comes out of that friendship, out of our experience, um, and um, from two different generations. So here we go. Yeah, so uh, I want to start just kind of asking you a question and let you kind of speak into this. You know, the, the theme of this week is cruciform. And if you're like me, it's like, what does that word mean? And uh, I, know, I know we're not supposed to ask that question because it's, a, it, you know, we're supposed to be smarter than that. But I would, I, would, I would love, you kind of made that word popular amongst our tribe. And I would love to just for you to kind of explain on the front end um, why that word's so significant to you, but even more importantly, why you think that word's so significant to us as a, a tribe, uh, especially in this season uh, of life and mission. Okay, yes. Um, if you look up cruciform in, say, Webster's, it, it simply says, um, shaped or arranged in a cross. And um, so it, it's kind of a simple definition, but a strange word. And back in 1990, 25 years ago, when I shared my proposed book title with a bun bunch of friends, most of them encouraged me to omit the word cruciform from this title. They said it was uh, unfamiliar, people wouldn't get it, it was just strange. But I kept it. And as I said in the original preface to that 1990 first edition, I said I kept it in hope that this image might become a dominant image by which churches of Christ speak of identifying the New Testament church. And in recent years, as some of you have probably noticed, uh, the word has become a cool word. I mean, I mean, making it into the title of several books like Michael Gorman, uh, and, and now even into the title of a major lectureship here this week. But... Let me say that cruciform, as I originally intended it, and as I think it's often used today, is a, is a shorthand word. It's kind of like the word trinity in the Christian vocabulary. Trinity is not a word you find in the Bible. And some restorationists, even today, object to that word because it's not in the Bible. And Alexander Campbell taught us that we must purify our speech and have every word to be a biblical word. But um, this word Trinity became a fundamental Christian word over the centuries because it serves as a useful shorthand for a central biblical truth, a complex biblical truth. What it, it refers to what we know about God now that Jesus Christ has come as the Messiah and after the Holy Spirit has been poured out at Pentecost. 
Because in the story of salvation, we've experienced God as the Creator Father and as the faithful Savior Son and as the comforting and empowering Holy Spirit. So the word Trinity catches up all of that in one word. So with cruciform, I think, it's a shorthand that captures the rich cluster of New Testament ideas surrounding the cross of Jesus Christ and how that cross impacts, how that cross shapes the life of us who are Jesus followers. And that's how I used it. So when, when Paul says, I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified, boy, what a rich set of few words that is. How do we unpack what that means for the life of the Christian community, for the life of disciples like you and me? That's, that's the cruciformity we're getting at. And I think of this, this line by the um, very influential recent theologian John Yoder, who said, I quote, people who carry crosses are working with the grain of the universe. There's a deep insight coming out of this cruciformity at the heart of the Christian faith. So when we take up our crosses with Jesus, whatever that may be, we, he says, are with the grain of this universe that God has made. So cruciform calls up as a shorthand this rich cluster of ideas characterizing the nature of discipleship after we have uh, experienced and now proclaim a crucified and resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, earlier this fall, I was actually here on campus, or this past fall I was on campus, and uh, I got to hear Leonard talk on this idea of cruciformity. is just this amazing uh, talk. But one of the things that I loved in the context of your talk was you gave this image, and you're talking about the journey that our, our fellowship, our tribe has gone on uh, over the years, the journey that some of us have taken, the journey that some of us will take, the journey that some of us are resisting. And you gave us... This, this metaphor, I remember you talking about an island and a mainland, and I, I thought it was one of the most brilliant kind of, kind of pictures of kind of where we find ourselves kind of in the midst of our tribe. And so uh, I'd love it if you just kind of share um, a little bit about the island and the mainland and where this um, idea of cruciformity kind of works into that as all of us uh, are seeking to be disciples because we don't want to just study the cruciform life or celebrate the cruciform life. We actually want to surrender to it, you know, to, to kind of step into it, figure out how we live this out. So if you could kind of give us that picture, uh, I think it would be helpful. Well, yes, the, the island. I, I was born on the island. Many of you were. I'm using this as a metaphor, you understand. Um, actually, I was born in Florida. It's a peninsula. But... Um, <laughs> But squarely on that island, out some miles off the mainland, um, I was reared in a small city in central Florida where my parents were stalwarts in the little Church of Christ in that town in central Florida. I was baptized at age 11 and still remember how grateful I felt, indeed how fortunate I felt to be a member of the one true church. But by age 16 or so, I began to sense some cracks and fissures in that true church ed edifice that, that in my family was the center of its world, became the center of my world. For many of you, the center of your world and my questions there in my mid-teens launched me on a long, shall we say at one level, intellectual quest through my college years and questions that eventually propelled me, uh, um, almost wouldn't let me stop this study um, into a sort of theological career. Because I needed to know where the type of Christianity that was so deeply instilled in me had come from. I sensed that it came from somewhere. I'd been told since early childhood that it came simply from the Bible. And through eight years of seminary and PhD work in Bible and historical theology, I learned that there was much more to that story, a whole lot more. 
And the quest for that bigger story was exciting and, and it was challenging, but also for me, troubling, emotionally unsettling. And so on this journey, eventually, um, I wrote and co-wrote several books over the next 15 years uh, that sort of mapped out this journey for me. These bu books, I, I hope, I think, were calm and measured and understated, but they marked out this journey. And it turned out, to my considerable surprise, that that same journey, my journey, spoke strongly to many thousands of people. I suspect some of you may have been among them. So, so when they begin, these books begin to appear about the late 80s, uh, one of them was Discovering Our Roots, and then in 1990, The Cruciform Church. Uh, um, there was lots of controversy, to be sure, but there was an amazing explosion of interest that I, I hadn't predicted. People throughout churches of Christ themselves seem to be on a journey. And over the, the, the years since that time, I've continued to hear from these people. And I, and I eventually recently realized what those books provided. And not just for them, for me. And this, this metaphor came to me. Uh, they, they, they formed, it seemed to me, for me and for others, a kind of bridge a bridge from where? A bridge from this island back to a, what we could call a Christian mainland, a bigger Christian world, uh, many other Christian traditions that had their own integrity, their own history. And so um, I, I'm pretty sure that a good many of you um, have been on that journey, something like that. You may have begun on an island, and that journey may have been a scary and halting journey, sometimes an angry journey, sometimes exhilarating. But, but then I realized, you know, I've gotten to know people over the years like Dave, um, who really, I thought, I sense, were not born on the island, like me. That's offensive. And they, no, they, I don't know where he was born, but uh, it wasn't just there. And maybe, I'm talking about all the millennials, you know, <laughs> here who... I'm just messing with you. Who, um, maybe many of them born on the mainland. Um... They didn't have to make the same journey. Um, they interact easily with brothers and sisters from other Christian traditions. They, they don't carry a load of guilt because you've stepped over old boundaries that were set so deeply and firmly. And, and they tend to wonder, as I've talked with guys like Dave, why do I have to keep hearing these old island stories? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> why, why can't we just move on to more important things, these great and new challenges that are before us now? And I would grant you, it is time to move on. Though I would I like to respectfully point out that those of us today who minister among churches of Christ must still de deal, one way or another, with the legacy of of the island heritage. Because the past is the past and we can't just walk away that easily from it. And we indeed have responsibility, it seems to me. So, for these past 35 years, I've, I've been immersed in the task of understanding this particular heritage of faith and helping insiders come to terms with it, insiders like me, islanders like me, come to terms with it, and then outsiders to better understand where we've come from and why we sometimes are viewed as a little weird. So I, I want to turn the question around to, to Dave here and say, what was it, island or mainland for you? It's so interesting. I remember when the first time you were telling that story, I was trying to figure it out, and 
Uh, I don't know where you kind of fall in, in the metaphor, where you find yourself in that story, but for me, I don't know if I was born on the island or the mainland, maybe a boat in between the two, and uh, you know, um, maybe, maybe that's my story. I grew up, uh, I am a fourth generation Church of Christ preacher, which uh, is, I don't know what that tells you, but that tells you something. <laughs> And uh, I remember, you know, at one point my dad's one of five boys, and at one point all five of them were Church of Christ preachers. And so I remember thinking, I'm never going to be a preacher. That's not going to be, it's not going to be my story. I don't know what I thought I was going to do, but um, I remember uh, kind of this in-between place. You know, I, I grew up uh, in Churches of Christ. Uh, I grew up in, in an amazing Church of Christ uh, with parents who I, I love and who have just been. Uh, honestly, two of my biggest heroes in, in my life. I love them. They've shaped me. they formed me. And, and yet at the same time, uh, there was something about the way that they raised us that uh, shielded us from some of the, uh, maybe from some of the negative realities of the island. Um, and so uh, I, I felt like I, I grew up and there was something about our kind of sea of sea heritage that at the same time it gave me roots and my parents also gave me wings. And I don't know if that, that sticks with any of you at all, but um, kind of in the context of our fellowship, uh, my parents gave me some, some big places to be rooted into, you know, um, that we are simply Christian. You know, uh, we are not the only Christians. I remember, I remember one time uh, hearing, you know, I'd moved away from home and someone had said, you know, how'd you handle growing up and people saying that we're the only Christians? And I said, what? Like... Is that a real thing? And they're like, yeah, that's kind of who we are. And I'm like, what well, no. <laughs> and, and so it was one of those moments where I realized, oh, they, they shielded me from that part of the island. I didn't, I didn't know that. Or every now and then we'll do something uh, in our context at Ethos, and people say, how'd you ever get past all of our baggage to do something like that? And, and I, I think, what baggage? <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know we were getting past something because uh, the, the reality is a lot of kind of what we've experienced uh, and I believe it's just been the grace of God and the love of parents and a community around me. Um, but a lot of what we've experienced has not been us running from the island. It's just been us running to the vision that God has put before us in the season. And, and I believe there's a big difference between running from something and running to something. And so I think a lot of times people are so surprised um, to hear just how much I love our fellowship, how much I, uh, I love our tribe and our churches, and because... I go, man, that, that was the place I came to know Jesus. Those were, those were the people that uh, loved me and showed me uh, the beauty of Christ and uh, taught me about the power of the Holy Spirit and taught me about the, the potency of the local church. And so I had all of these amazing experiences um, that came out of our background, and yet I never felt like they were the fence that kept us from, from running into the kingdom of God. And there have been times when I talked to people that maybe felt like they are born on the island, and they speak of our heritage, and it's almost as if our heritage is the fence that keeps us from playing in the wild adventure of God. And uh, for whatever reason, um, uh, just by the grace of God, I, I never really felt that tension. I, I felt like our heritage actually gave me permission to play in the, the broader kind of kingdom, kind of kingdom stream. Could, could you maybe extend that just a little bit, Dave, and talk about maybe how that particular... Um, spirit has played out some in the church that you lead now? Uh, I think kind of in the core of who we are as a, a fellowship, you know, you, you go back to our Restoration Roots, uh, we've always been pioneering people, and pioneering people aren't scared of the unknown. And it's, it's just this sense of, man, there is, there is something beyond, and the something beyond, whatever price we have to pay to get there, it's worth it for the pleasure that lies beyond, right? That's just... That's who pioneers are, and, and that's in the spirit of our heritage, but somewhere along the way, I think that kind of got trampled out of us. I don't know, I mean, you're the theologian, or the historian, you can tell us where that happened, but um, I think that was one of, I think that's one of the graces. I remember even with my parents, uh, it, I mean, just very simply being raised as a kid and them saying things like, hey, whatever you see Jesus doing in the scriptures, you can be a part of. And I'm like, that's really great news. I mean... He's doing some really awesome things in the, in the scriptures. And so there was kind of this open-handed permission to be a part of anywhere where God was at work. Because if God's at work, it surely can't be bad, right? Yeah, I'll say that again. If God's at work, it can't be bad, right? Like, I'm like, if he's there, like, we, can, we can get in on that. And, and so there was, this, there was kind of this, um, this, uh, this 
freedom, this, this joy that I grew up with in our tribe. And I, I didn't realize that that was kind of a, uh, maybe some of you that wasn't your experience, but um, I grew up with this sense of, wow, man, we can do anything with God because God is here and he is real and he is awesome. And, and so just kind of that permission um, when I found myself stepping kind of into adulthood, it gave me the permission to, to interact with and live in the kingdom in ways that some of my friends didn't feel they had the, they actually felt like they were betraying their roots. They felt like they were betraying um, uh, sometimes even the word of God or, or uh, you know, kind of our, the call of God on our life to do that. So. Um, so, uh, let, let, stay with me on that metaphor here um, a little more this week. Um, metaphors have, their, have limited usefulness, but maybe they have some, this has some usefulness for a good many of you. Um, so so here, here we are um, on a, a larger Christian mainland. Um, and, and here we are in a, in a culture that is, um, I would say, increasingly, uh, certainly post-Christendom, and even maybe moving more into a post, post-Christian kind of setting. At least Christians are being marginalized culturally more than we have been used to for a long time. So there's a new kind of challenge in this, this land, this larger land, you might say, that we, many of us feel like we where we live, um, and we're faced with the challenge of living out the mission of God in this place. Um, let, let, me, let me repeat something here just for a moment as we move into that, more on that conversation that many of you have heard me say before over the years. Our, our task, it seems to me, as Christians who become increasingly aware of our own heritage, our own tradition, is not a kind of vain avoidance of tradition. We've tended to think that tradition is mostly a bad thing. We just want the New Testament. But uh, we've learned, I think, or are learning that tradition is unavoidable. I mean, you have one. It's like you have a family. Whether you really like it or not, you have a family. And the challenge then is, what, what, how can we maintain a dynamic and healthy tradition going forward. And there are two key things here, and this is, of course, the trick. One is to maintain some kind of connectivity to the past. Not try to just lop it off as a waste, but to say, yeah, there there there's some things here. Whose shoulders, people have shoulders I stand on. There are some ideals and some vision here that uh, I want to take forward, but not slavishly bound to it and able, experiencing, in a sense, the freedom to face a new world, a new landscape with new kinds of challenges that maybe our forebears didn't face in quite the same way. And that is the trick. Appreciative connectivity on the one hand and a kind of bold adventure with God toward the new on the other. That's sort of where we are, I think, here. It's a good place to be. And I, and I want to ask uh, Dave to reflect a little more on the living out of that mission as he has helped lead and experience it in inner city Nashville, if you, if you would, a bit. Yeah, you know, I think one of the things, and I just want to speak this as a word of encouragement over you. I don't know where you kind of are in your story, where you even find yourself kind of in the midst of this narrative, but... I think at the heart of this, um, we, have to, we have to start with this understanding that um, we are loved by God. Like, do you know that? Like, I mean, like, you are loved by God. You are the beloved of God. And uh, we, we are loved by God and that by His grace and His power, we have something to offer the kingdom. We have, we have, we have something to, to offer the world that there, there are things to kind of live into, and I, I love that idea that you talk about connectivity to the past, because I think sometimes there's this sense of, man, let's just forget it, let's start new, or let's hold on tightly, and we tend to find ourselves in one of those kind of two extremes. But one of the things that we've really tried to kind of do as we've stepped into this, uh, you know, whatever's next, is to ask God, okay, um, how, how do we hold on to the blessings of, 
uh, of our heritage and, and live into the fullness of whatever it is that you have um, before us. And so uh, kind of in our context, it, for us, it's meant that we have to be okay as we engage kind of this like post-Christian world. We have to be okay um, with people finding a sense of belonging in our midst long before they believe the things we believe and behave the way that we behave. And uh, for us, it's, it's been a, a really central kind of shift in, in the heart of who we are, going, okay, how do we, how do we create a, a church culture? If we're going to be a cruciformed li- uh, people, if we're going to be a, a cruciformed church, then it means that our lives are going to be formed into the very image of Jesus. And, and here's kind of one of the ways that we say it, kind of in our midst, is, is we want to be about making disciples. That was the primary mission of Jesus. And a disciple is someone who can do what Jesus did, the way that Jesus did it, uh, for the motives that Jesus did those things with in the presence of Jesus. Like, uh, you know, if you are being an apprentice of an electrician, what are you learning how to do? You're learning how to do the work of an electrician, not just learning the, the intellectual skills of electricity. You are learning how to do it. And so Jesus says, I'm, I'm raising you up to be my apprentices. I'm raising you up to be my disciples. Um, I, I want you to do the things that I've done. And so we, we've kind of embraced this reality. Okay, if we are going to be disciples of Jesus, if we're going to do the things that Jesus did, part of that means us engaging people the way that Jesus engaged people. Having a a, a cruciformed life, a cross-shaped life means we we find ourselves in the homes of Zacchaeus's. We find ourselves in the homes of of people who uh, maybe in years past wouldn't have found room to play. And so real practical, I'll try to just bring this down to the ground for you. Uh, We're always looking for ways to bring outsiders around the table. Like how, how, do we, how do we bring them into our midst and allow them to, to contribute in significant and meaningful ways long before um, they believe in Jesus? So this past week I was hanging out with a good friend of mine. Uh, some of you maybe heard uh, me tell this story before. When we started the church seven years ago, uh, his name's Cody, and uh, uh, we needed a sound guy. And I was thinking, okay, how can we find somebody to run sound who doesn't love Jesus, you know, because you don't have to love Jesus to run sound. And so I'm, I'm trying to figure out who can we find uh, to, to do this. Uh, I'm going to trick him into the kingdom of God. He'll have to <laughs> sit behind the soundboard and, you know, hear my sermons week after week after week. And so Cody shows up and he's there helping us in the park. And, and I remember that first day we were there in the park, he's running the soundboard and, and he's, he's smoking and, and uh, uh, you know, no big deal. Well, a few weeks later, we moved from the park into the space that we're currently in, into this nightclub, and, and he's sitting there, and uh, the first night we're in this nightclub, getting ready to have church, he said, hey, am I allowed to smoke in here? Can I, can I smoke in this room? And, and I said, it's, it's a nightclub, I guess you can. I hadn't really thought about that. No one had ever asked me if they could smoke inside a church, and so I said, <laughs> I, I said sure, sure, go for it. So he, he lights up and he smokes all through church. And then the next week, you know, we're a small church at this time, like 40 or 50 people. The next week, there's like five people smoking. And then the next week, you know, 10 people smoking. And, and people started smoking, I think, just so they could smoke at church. And, uh, and it, he was there. And I remember this, this one evening in particular, uh, this, this couple came up and, and they, said, they said, Dave, we love what's going on here. We love the church. But man, the smoking is terrible. And I'm like, I agree with you. I hate it. Like, it, it, is, it is the worst thing ever. And, and, and they said, okay, well, we've we got a choice to make. Like, what, what are we going to do? Uh, they, said, they said, either he goes or we go, but we, we, we just can't handle anymore. And I remember finding ourselves in this place, okay. And I thought, here this couple, they tithe, they serve, they love us, they're amazing, they're stable. Like, it, it's great. We don't have anybody like them in our church hardly. Um, but I thought, man, if, if, if they leave, they're going to go to another church. They're fine. They're saved. I thought, but if, if he leaves, he's not going to another church. And there, there's this moment that we had to make a decision. And, you know, we had to say goodbye to the family, you know, that, that was tithing and serving and, and bought into who we were. And it, it, I tell that story. Many of you have probably heard me tell that story many times. It's been a, a real touch point for us as a church family uh, because several years later, um, you know, I got to watch Cody come to Jesus, and I got to do his wedding as he married an amazing godly woman, and now he's on staff at a church up in Brooklyn, New York, and he was in, in Nashville this past week, and I thought, okay, so how do you evangelize in a post-Christendom world? You smoke cigarettes in church, and, and you do the, not really, but um, you, you create spaces for people to come as they are, but with an understanding that Jesus transforms them, and so you know, one of the things that we tell our people is, 
everybody can come as they are, but no one is free to stay there. Like, you come as you are, but you don't come to Jesus with conditions, you know? Like, if you've come to Jesus with a set of conditions, you haven't actually come to Jesus. And, and, and that's for those of us that grew up in church and those of us that didn't. And so I think one of the ways that we've kind of tried to, to navigate having lives and ministry that's being formed by the very nature of Jesus himself is to say, hey, how do we, how do we enter in? How do we create space for people who uh, to really participate who maybe you wouldn't have otherwise? When, let me just say, when my wife and I came to Ethos just less than two years ago, um, I would testify that what Dave's talking about was, um, was uh, palpable. And I, I was just struck. I mean, maybe, you know, coming in from something different into that, I was just struck. There's a really, really low bar here. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, almost anybody can just walk right in and, and you'll hear the welcome that says, come join us in serving the city. And the assumption is that little behind the scenes, that when you do that with these other, these sold out disciples, uh, you're going to be changed. You're going you're to experience something that may just lead to belief and commitment to Jesus Christ. It's, it's, thing, it's turned around in, in this sense. Yeah, you know, because I actually think that's the shape of Jesus' ministry. You know, when did the disciples become Christians? Right? <laughs> like, like, when was that moment? What I love about the, the cross-shaped life, the, the cruciform life, is the disciples, they were preaching sermons, healing the sick, raising the dead, um, before they even confessed Jesus as Lord. I mean... You know, I mean, that's like varsity level Christianity. I mean, they were, they were on this journey with Jesus. He said, hey, he, he said, come in. And, and you think about even kind of that path of formation that Jesus had with the disciples. You remember how it starts in John chapter 1? They're like, hey, Jesus, where are you going? And what's he say? He says, hey, come and see. Like, that's the initial call, right? Like, hey, come and see. And then you get a few chapters later, hey, Jesus, where are you going? He's like, come and die. And I'm like, whoa. <laughs> like, <laughs> Come again, like the, 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 the arc of that journey got a little more intense, right? But isn't that the way that um, the journey of Jesus works? He, 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 says, he, says, he says, come into the kingdom. And as we, as we come into the kingdom, he, he keeps inviting us into this, this level of intensity. And I think that's one of the things that we've tried to embrace. I, I think that's maybe ministry on the mainland or mission on the mainland is, I, I think as a fellowship, we have, to, we have to embrace the come and see aspect of Jesus' ministry. Um, without letting go of the come and die. Because I think sometimes there's this fear of if we hold on to the come and see, we'll never get to the come and die. And, and I go, no, if when Jesus becomes your Christ, he always shows you your cross. Like, you don't have to worry about finding the cross. Like, if he's your Christ, there will be a cross. So, so if, if, if we can show them that he's the Christ, if, if they can walk and journey with this, I think, I think the, the other piece comes as well. So, Maybe we have just three or four minutes left in our in our time. Um, maybe tell us what that looks like. Uh, someone just comes, as it were, where there's no no bar to jump over, and they uh, maybe find some friends. They they, they find that you're going to go out and serve uh, with what is a room in the inn or some other uh, Nashville uh, downtown ministry, and you say. Come with us. Tell us a little more about that journey as you've witnessed it over these years at Ethos. Yeah, you know, so one of the things that uh, we do this throughout the year in a variety of ways, but uh, I think one story that just came to my mind is on Easter Sunday every year, we'll take up a, a huge collection and we'll raise a lot of money. And the next week, we'll give 100% of that money away uh, to bless the city. And we'll cancel our church services the Sunday after Easter. And people go out in the city and they'll serve all over the city together. And so what we always tell our people is, hey, invite your friends to come be a part of Easter Sunday. They're going to hear about the resurrected Jesus. And then the next week, they're going to get to go experience the resurrection of Jesus as you go out in the city and as you serve. And, and we found that non-Christians um, love doing that uh, as well. And so a few years ago, when we had come up with this idea, we thought, okay, we're trying to raise $165,000 on one Sunday, um, which for you may not seem like a lot. Our first year as a church, we gave $72,000 the whole year. Um, so for us, $165,000 on one Sunday is a ton of money. And so we thought, okay, we've got to raise more money than we've ever raised, and we're giving 100% of it away. How should we do this? 
And so we have this atheist who's a part of our church, and he's a brilliant guy. And I thought, what if we let him head up our capital campaign? And I thought, it makes sense, right? You know, he's, a, he's the smartest guy in our church. And, and uh, I thought, let's, let's let this guy head up our capital campaign. And he blew the roof off of it. This guy, and so he's like researching, and I'm like, okay, I'm like, hey, I want you to just kind of get in there, and I know you don't believe in Jesus, but would you mind just like it kind of getting your mind around why Jesus would care that we do something like this? And so, you know, he's not stupid. He knew what I was doing. He's like, <laughs> he's like Dave, just tell me to read the Bible. I'm like, okay, <laughs> would you read the Bible? So, but but, but he, he went after it, and, and, and he got after it, and he got a church and all these people kind of in, into this idea, and so... We, we've been on this amazing journey, so he, he leads our capital campaign. He starts bringing in non-believers and different groups and companies to match this Christian gift for the city. And he helped us mobilize all these Christians and non-Christians to go out in the city and, and to serve. And I go, I think that's the, uh, I think that's the sort of thing that we, we try to do as we go on this journey saying, hey, how do we meet them where they are, invite them all the way in, let them participate in significant ways. And, and what we found is, you know, the way he's growing in Jesus is, is phenomenal. He just got done co-leading a mission trip to Kenya over Christmas. He's still not a Christian. And I go, I go, but he is a disciple. He's being discipled. I mean, that looks a lot like Peter, Andrew, James, and John getting out of the boat, doesn't it? Like, and he's like, I haven't confessed Jesus yet as Lord, but I'm hanging out with him every day. I'm going where he's going, I'm doing what he's doing. I'm like, I'm like that's, that, that's the essence of, and, and what I know is, man, when he becomes a, follow, when he becomes a full-fledged follower of Jesus, holy smokes, he is going to blow the doors off the kingdom of God. It's going to be amazing, and I can't wait to, to watch it. And so we're just committed to that journey in him. Um, okay, a little secret here. Um, first, let me say, I, I love this man and admire him enormously. And it's a privilege to get to stand alongside and me do a little theology. My, my real goal here, he hadn't heard me say this, is to get him to tell you some of these stories and give you some windows into how the mission of Christ is unfolding in some new ways here in the inner city, in, in the buckle of the Bible Belt. Amen. And you'll hear some more of those stories tomorrow, I guarantee, because I'm going to tease them out of him. <laughs> but um, that, that's really what I'm about. Here. And tomorrow our focus is going to be on the word of the cross and the way of the cross and what that means for the mission of God at this strange and important juncture in our Western journey. So, thank you and uh, God bless and uh, enjoy the riches of the world.